Hello, everybody. My name is Aaron Canole, and welcome back once again to another edition of the Movie Battleground. And tonight, uh, we have a couple of guys returning here who, uh, so when I was looking at the matchups and who I could pair up against each other, I knew I wanted to play these guys against each other because as weird as it sounds, they've had basically the exact same career trajectory. Both of these guys came in at the start of battle, the reboot of Battleground last year. They were both rookies to this. They had, uh, as far as I'm aware, at least never debated uh, in anything like this. And they came in and by random nature of wheel spin, they were both matched up against literal tight previous title winning or title level competitors. And let's just say it didn't go that well for them. They took their losses in stride, they went back down, and upset competitors who in the previous match may have looked a little stronger or potentially ready for the win and took that first victory and then ended up against top-level competitors a second time in a row to unfortunately take a loss. And so now they are here, they are looking for that second win to put them back on track, and we're looking to see how much they have learned and grown from these ma matchups. We have Andy Sweet versus Kevin Moreno, and I, for one, am interested to see where this goes. Uh, but enough talking about them. Let's talk to them and introduce our first competitor, entering with a record of one win and two defeats. He is Kevin Moreno. Kevin, welcome back to the Battleground, sir. How are you doing? I'm less of a mess, but I'm doing fine. How about you, sir? Doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, so obviously the last time we saw you, you were uh, unfortunately on the uh, losing end of a knockout match uh, against Henry Sanchez. Now, if it makes that feel any better to you, he went on to win the title and also beat people who were undefeated. So, you know, you're in decent company when it comes to people who have lost to Henry. But you're here, you're back, and you're looking to rebound from that loss. Uh, just how are you feeling overall going into this? Really fine. Um, uh, I, mean, I actually this time I'm, I'm glad that I this match uh, had did not have had the long delayed of my of the past few match I've been trying to get Evan scheduled for, and, That's um, and hopefully um, at least this guy is on my level because this because like my last match and and against Jeremy I'm like I had the unfortunate of hey hey uh, Kevin you're going to finish against people that paid years ago i'm like what I'm like okay so this time i'm i think i probably have uh some confidence for this uh with the, going up against my opponents i'm pretty sure he's good he has the same confidence against me as well but hopefully this uh it's gonna end well for him, at least me at least absolutely man well at, at the very least a win is excellent. Not getting knocked out is still an improvement. Uh, and as you said, this is a much more on your level. So hopefully it goes your, it goes a better way for you tonight. I'm going to go ahead and set you in the back for the moment as I introduce your opponent coming in also with a record of one win, two defeats. He is Andy Sweet coming in. Andy, welcome back, sir. Uh, you're, you're also in... A slightly better situation this time. Uh, last time you played was on the heels of making a, I don't know how many hours drive back from LA with probably minimum sleep, uh, yeah. but you soldiered through. Uh, it didn't end well. That was also a knockout loss for you. Uh, yeah. But if it makes you feel any better, I kicked Matt's ass and he doesn't play anymore. So, you know, again, take your wins where you can get them. Uh, how are you feeling coming into this? Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, I had to go lick my wounds, kind of rethink my whole game plan. Um, it's fun to be playing someone that's kind of had the same path as me, so it should be interesting today. Um, decided to bring a little luck with me, and where obviously, obviously everyone knows I'm a corruption shill. This is a uh, custom jersey for Mr. Mike Kalinowski, so I'm going to bring some IG champ luck with me today and see how that works, maybe. Um, he likes to debate, I like to debate, so it should be fun. All right. Any lucky charms that you need, Kevin has the same. I want to say, is I've never asked, is it a Pokemon? It looks familiar, but I don't know what it is. Oh, it's my manager, Mr. Normal. It is. Okay. Well, you both got your good luck charms, boys, and we have a match to play, so let's get to it. 
Movie Battleground is a game that is a best of five rounds and is a first to three points wins. Each round is worth one point. If a competitor happens to get three points in a row tonight, that will be a victory by knockout and we'll all get to go home early. If it is a 2-2 tie at the end of the four rounds, we do have a fifth round. It is called the blind round. I don't think, no, Andy has experienced it. Kevin has avoided it so far, but we will see if we need it at the end of this game. In terms of how the main four rounds will work, each competitor was given the questions. They were given the time to prep. They were given the answers. They had everything that they needed. They will get 60 seconds to open, followed by two minutes to expand on their argument. There will be a four-minute open debate where they can trade blows back and forth and get in as many points as possible, followed by a 60-second closing period, at which point they will surmise and finish up their arguments. Following that, I have two great judges backstage in Sean Sandberg and Zachary Shelton. They'll come on screen and make the deliberations. If a tiebreaker vote is needed, then I will serve as third judge and make that deliberation alongside them with all of that said guys are you both ready to go let's do it ready all right so as we go ahead and get into this we will get to our first question and it is a question that has been graced to you guys not by myself but instead by one of your fellow competitors as this is a viewer submitted question these are questions that are submitted by viewers players judges anybody on the outside that wants to see their question debated in movie battleground if you are somebody who wants to see your question in movie battleground the email is at the bottom there official aaron canol because i like to sound important the at is at gmail.com go ahead and email me there please include your name on the email if i don't know who's sending it to me i will not use the question because that means there is a possibility of you getting your own question so just include your name include any questions you'd like and keep it you know rated r at least uh and send them in and we will put them in and the question that we have presented here tonight is brought to you by will cohen and the question is what is ben affleck's most underrated film now uh this is all of ben affleck's career uh he is technically only eligible in movie battleground as an actor uh however because uh, he only has four films he doesn't meet the qualification as a director but since he stars in three of his four films the separate rule for affleck has been made that all of his films are eligible gone baby gone wasn't chosen so there's really no reason for me to say this i'm just pointing it out for future reference uh but with that said we're going to go ahead and get into the question andy uh based on the fact that you have at least played into a blind round before uh that was the slight statistical advantage that gave you the favorite spot tonight you chose to go first on questions one and three kevin you'll go first on questions two and four and as your timer enters the screen and gets reset back by about 10 seconds that was weird uh i will go ahead and leave and the round can begin all right so um i went with oddly one of the movies we were just talking about i chose the town as his most underrated movie um you know uh i'll just save the rest for that but for right now i chose the town that's my i'll succeed the rest of my time Well, that is the definition of an opening, ladies and gentlemen. He at least <laughs> got his answer. Uh, and, hey, we don't require anyone to speak longer than they have to, so let me get that timer down. There we go. Kevin, you'll get three seconds back. That will be ghosted to you because I'm not rerunning that back by three seconds. But your time begins when you speak. Right. When thinking of, of the most underrated uh, Ben Affleck movie, I, of course, obviously went to the gap into the 2017 film directed by Gavin O'Connor, The Accountant, and I yield my time. All right, they're playing the same ball game, ladies and gentlemen. I said they were in league with each other. I didn't think it was this literal. Uh, a league of their own, if I could. That was fucking awful. All right, I'm going to shut up and let one of these guys talk. Uh, Andy, back over to you, sir. The Town versus The Accountant. All right, so, uh, you know, going into this movie... Um, Ben Affleck hadn't had much of an acting career. You know, he'd done little things here and there. Daredevil was in there. Little cameos here and there, but nothing really much to say. Um, and then he directed a movie, Gone Baby Gone. Wasn't in it, you know. Um, people still talk about that. And then I feel like his next one that he directed was The Town. And um, that was kind of his coming out party. You know, that was his like, hey, I can act. I'm going to direct myself, but I can act. And I'm going to put a bunch of good people around me too, people that you guys don't know about. And um he took a little bit of true story, um, you know, for Boston in the 90s. And a little bit before that, they had a lot of bank robberies and kind of mixed it with heat. And uh, we, we got this really cool movie called The Town um, that I think he's really good in. And um, 
you know, it, it's bank robbing taken to a whole nother level. It's a little bit more intense than heat, I feel like. And, and um, he plays this guy going on a journey um, of trying to find himself, I guess, if you will, and figure out who he is. And um, I feel like it was a good showcase of him showing, hey, I can act. I'm more than just the guy who wrote Goodwill Hunting at that point. It had been a long time. This movie came out in 2010 and um, made 37 million, made 154. But, you know, I, I feel like people don't talk about it when they're talking about Ben Affleck movies. You know, they talk about, uh, you know, Gone Baby Gone or Argo or Goodwill Hunting um, or Batman. But I feel like people should be talking about The Town. Really good movie. Uh, really well filmed, really well acted, everyone around it. John Hamm at the height of Mad Men is in this movie. You got Jeremy Renner, who really had done The Hurt Locker, and that was about it at that point. And then he came along and did this movie as well. And um, it came out at a really interesting time, too. Two weeks after it came out, Social Network came out, and Inception was actually still out at that time and just demolishing everything at the box office. And that's my time for right now. All right. We'll go ahead and skip the clock forward a little bit there. Kevin, you have two minutes on the clock for The Accountant. Okay. The Accountant, the Accountant uh, star, starring Ben Affleck and Drake and Cameron O'Connor, it, I, I think it's one of those underrated role, uh, film. It, it's something we've, yet, we've never seen uh, Ben Affleck in quite a while, and, that, and that's kind of like an actual thriller role. I know there was Paycheck, but there's one he's actually really good in. Um, he plays a like, kind of like an accountant. Uh, he does like a business account. Um, who, he's also like kind of like in the secret assassin spy. Um, who goes the number and also it's one of the parts I did like is um, he plays someone who I think who's if I remember I think on the spectrum or has Asperger's, and he plays it with respect. He doesn't do something like what music did and. Treat like do not treat it to treat that kind of form of uh, I um uh, what is no word to describe it but uh as in like as form of like a kind of like a part uh like something insulting but he played it with respect um he worked. He works uh worked with great co-stars of Anna Kendrick, John Bernthal, John Lithgow. He also um he also like play plays it with the exact tone of serious, but you kind of also with a comedic tone as well. You you laugh at I think as part of one of the most strange jokes that's uh dialogue that's form with Ken and Kendrick with evolving paintings on how about it. I yield my time. All right. So we are going to head into the four minute open discussion. Once the timer clicks zero, the first competitor can speak and the timer will continue once that happens. But here's okay, here's the thing with the town. The town, it's no way underrated. It is his best directorial film. Acting wise, he's fine. He's fine. It's fine. There's no. It's no way I will ever. We're working. I'm gonna say the town is overrated or awful. No, it's perfectly rated as fine it is. Did it came out? Did it came out at the wrong time of of other big award kind of which are with with the social network and oh and also. Inception it, uh, came out months ago around the summer. Yeah, yeah, but but still, but still, it is perfectly it perfectly uh read fine. It's great. It has still has great appeal, great critic appeal, and I and I don't think I, I don't think it's really considered that much of an underrated film. Uh, the account I really do consider an underrated film because like, it's it's one that I think. Nobody really is much talk about that much anymore. It can... I think the reason people don't talk about it is it's kind of your basic guy's really good at what he does. They double cross him. So he has to go against everything he knows. And then he saves the day and disappears at the end of the night. And he prevails. What? So it's kind of like, you know, it's we've been there, done that, you know, and it's, it's actually yeah. not really because here's the thing. 
And the story uh, about it is, um, he does make kind of he's good at what he does, but he also has like deal with uh, a form of government official, uh, keeping ties on it, but does no know why. You also um slowly he builds the story of how he, uh, Ben Affleck and John Bernthal became uh, became close as a as brothers in this family of, you see his story. Story. And it's uh, like, yeah, and then you see that with the town too. You know, you, you see his relationship with Jeremy Renner and the, the way the two of them play with their relationship of being close friends and the way they both progress in different ways by the end is really great to see. And it's, you know, in this movie, like I said before, Ben Affleck hadn't really had anything. He had, you know, still trying to recover from Daredevil and all the other flops he had made. And so he said, hey, I'm going to do this movie. And everyone said, I don't think so. And, you know, it's all they ever talked about was Jeremy Renner. He got the Oscar nomination. But I feel like Ben Affleck was great in that, too, the way he played off of him, the way he played off of John Hamm as the FBI agent was really awesome or whatever agency he was from. And it was just great to see him playing off of these other people and telling the story in a unique way of a cat and mouse game of going back and forth and him trying to stay one step ahead of them. And everything with Rebecca Hall, that whole relationship was great, too, of him trying to toe that line of making sure she stays in line, but then he falls in love with her and the conflict he deals with himself and trying to make the right decision. And the way it ended was really great as well too, of him giving her her happy piece and him getting his happy piece with everything that happened there. And I just think he told that story really well, both behind the camera and in front of a camera, actually. He he uh, he thought great, but here's the thing. I would get to think it like, it like, it was an overshadow of, the Daredevil, because here's the thing, Gone Baby Gone, while well, that was his box, uh, directorial debut, that also got him the Oscar for Best Director. Nope. He doesn't have a Best Director Oscar. It, yes, he does. Nope. Are you sure? Oh, for Argo? For Argo, no, then? No, no uh, for Gone Baby Gone, I said. Hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so but still, he didn't, he didn't act in that, so, um, you know, it's... it's it was good, but yeah, I feel like this was the movie. This was the movie that he should have gotten recognized more for it. And everyone talks about Argo as his masterpiece, and oh, yeah. you know, and then he tried to follow it up with Live by Night. We all know how that went. That was really bad. If you've yeah. never seen it, don't see it. <laughs> that would be super bad. I, I know it's quite uh, sorry for the sidebar people, but but yeah, yeah um, but you kind of actually uh, it really does uh, go back to what what he did originally. Like, uh, of going with the actor role, especially uh, with the uh, the quick sneaking uh, gun, uh, quiet gun battle with with silencer between him and John Burthall quietly shooting each other but not realizing who each other are, it's really quite well. All right, and that will close out the open discussion round. We're going to go into one minute closings. Andy, you are back up on deck first. Time starts when you begin speaking. All right. Uh, so like I said, The Town, 2010, kind of Ben Affleck's resurgence, if you will, showing he can act, um, playing really well off of John Hamm, really well off of Jeremy Renner. I like that whole relationship, the way they played that out of ending at different parallels. Um, you know, I feel like it got lost because it came out during the same time as Social Network. Inception was still out in the theaters. And The Town is the more underrated Ben Affleck movie in my mind. That's my time. All right, concise as he can get it there. Uh, Kevin, once the clock rolls around to zero, you can begin speaking at any point. All right. Hey, here we go. Uh, well, the town is, I think it's really great, uh, and I think it's one of his best uh, uh, Ben Affleck's film. It is one of the best, clearly, not underrated. It's not so underrated. It's perfectly rated. It's it's really quite notable. The account, it's really not, uh, uh, not that, not that well, uh, not that well, uh, notified still. I, uh, it's Ben Affleck really at its best, and it's the reason why I think why Ben Affleck, uh, can, uh, worked with, uh, Gavin O'Connor again with the way back. He, uh, he knows, uh, how, like, how, how he, how he's got him down. Uh, Work, work together. He is. It is it's Ben Affleck really at his really great, uh, at his best. This is really one of truly his underrated films, and I yield my time. All right, guys. As the clock winds down, 
Thank you guys. A very solid first round there. Listen, it's been a bit for both of these guys. They're shaking the rust off. They're getting ready. I'll give you some more time in the back to shake that off as I bring our judges in. Uh, and the only real uh, point of contention that was worth looking at the fact check was the Ben Affleck Oscar. Uh, so Ben Affleck actually has a 100% Oscars ratio. He has been nominated twice. He has won twice. However, despite the fact that what most people might praise him for now is his direction, he has never won for being a director. He won Best Original Screenplay for Good Will Hunting, and he won Best Picture as a producer for Argo, but he has never been nominated, nor has he won a Best Director award. In fact, it was one of the big things uh, talked about at the Oscars that year because at the time there had been a streak of years where the Best Director Award and the Best Picture Award went to the same film. This was the first time in a long time that someone who won Best Picture was not even considered for Best Director. But with all of that said, Sean, I move up to you, sir. You will have the first say on this, so as concise as you can hit it for me, who gets your vote and what sold you? Uh, I'd have to give it to Andy. I felt like this argument kind of got diverted a lot of the time uh, as to which film was better rather than which film was more underrated. Um, the point that Kevin made about the town being perfectly rated was really good, but he didn't make enough points about what makes the accountant underrated. And the ones that he did, Andy hit back on. So I'd have to give Andy my point. Okay. Zach, I go down to you. Who gets your vote and what was the selling point? Um, for me, the selling, the, the person that wins is Andy for me, because I felt like he better explained why the town is underrated. He basically said about how the accountant has similar story beats that we've had before, but he also explained like why it's underrated in terms of the other movies that came out at the same time or the other movies that Ben Affleck has done that have, uh, pe people have talked about more. Okay. All right, Judas, thank you guys so much. I'll go ahead and sit you in the back as we move on to round number two. And in round number two, we are going to move over from Ben Affleck to something that Ben Affleck has done before, and that is a comic book movie. In fact, he's done a couple of them. Some you might say are good, and some you might say are bad, and some you might say are daredevil. Uh, but with that said, we're going to go ahead and talk about performances the question on the table is uh i have phrased it as who but that's probably grammatically incorrect but hey i use these banners for every question who what the question is the best performance by a leading hero in a comic book movie i feel like over the last couple of years a lot a lot of focus has been put on the villain performances in these films, whether it be the fact that two different Jokers within a span of 11 years won an Oscar, or movies like uh, Black Panther or Thanos with Infinity War and Endgame. The villain performances have overshadowed the heroes a lot in the last few years, but who did deliver those top performances? Kevin, you are starting us this time around, so the timer is here for you, and it will start ticking when you begin speaking. Uh, the best I, I consider the what consider the best uh, lead uh, role in in the in the comic here here in the comic movie is easily um, uh, Hugh Jackman uh, as Wolverine in in the self titled movie Logan, and I yield my time. <laughs> Hey, if anything, these short intros are helping the video run time. Andy, I will head over to you, sir, and your opening will begin when you start speaking. Um, it's a good one. Well, there's another one. Um, and it's one that took 10 appearances in 11 years, and that would be Tony Stark, Robert Downey Jr., and Endgame. And I will secede the rest of my time. Make it easy for you, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of the night, I will know exactly where the next round begins. Not there, though. Uh, all right, Kevin, over to you, sir. Uh, you will have two minutes on the clock to expound upon Hugh Jackman in Logan. Uh, Hugh Jackman Logan, um, in the Logan, uh, he gives a really good uh, and amazing performance. This is really without a doubt his best. It, it earns back his, his years ever since the year 2000. Uh, of him playing the uh, the child character of Wolverine in the first second movie. Ever since then, um, he he's earned it 
especially with this problem is because it's years after 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 like uh the situation with the X Men um can you like uh, he's he is one of only a few immune left. He is a grilled up old like old man based off uh the the well known comic of of old man Logan. You see him uh and his uh, journey really at his now his lowest point of he is like he is like his old he is um like oh you can see all the greatness there. You could see him um, even like his eating factor is it's slowly uh losing its effect. You see uh, you see, you know, like, like now, like, like he really had to lose her. Like he, he gives a magnificent performance uh, in this movie. He, you see, him, I think now, like, uh, after year after years of of of, of years, of years well, that that has spoken to Logan, uh, especially with especially with the uh, with the connection of where he treats um X twenty three as his da- as his daughter. Like as it, like it treats they treat as the daughter, not the daughter though. So, and and that's why I really think he really, this is really it's his best performance. He well, like, especially uh, when you're working uh, with a with uh, Patrick Stewart uh, as um uh, as a person for his favor, and he's losing his uh. Slowly uh, going uh, with during uh, with in his mind with green power, and we, we may have led to it to to the mutants. Uh, and I yield my time. All right, so the clock will wind down. Andy, time is up for you when you start speaking. Okay, so two thousand eight, we meet Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man. Um, you know. Lots of drug addiction. We didn't know the whole story of how he ended up there. And then at the end of that movie, he said three words, I am Iron Man. And I feel like that's kind of what they built on. And over the course of ten other mo- or nine other movies after Iron Man won, 11 years, he had different decisions, different character arcs, everything. And it all led up to this last movie, this three-hour epic. And you got to kind of see the consequences and the fruits of all of his decisions as he's made and all the weight on his shoulders, the almost dying, the losing of someone he thought of as a son in Peter Parker, someone he's, you know, trained and kind of took under his wing and all of that leading up to this movie and for him to kind of go through that journey in that movie um, and putting aside his ego and everything and realizing he is the superhero that he needs to be and becoming that by the end of that movie. Um, harping back to a conversation him and Cap have in Avengers 1 where Cap's like, you'll never be the guy to jump on the grenade. And that's finally what Tony did to save everyone else, including his own family that he didn't want to lose. He had to lose them. And, um, you know, that took that I am Iron Man from the first one into the last one. It had so much different meaning. And uh, just to see that on his face and just kind of see that character over all that years build up to that just made it that much more powerful in the theater when you were watching that. You're like, oh man, I believe that. Um, that was awesome, you know, and just being on that journey to see that. And it was just a really good performance and uh, just a really good hero performance to, you know, build that over a almost like a three story arc over the course of 10 movies. And that's my time. I'm hitting all the wrong buttons here. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that was a mess. Okay. All right. Four minutes is on the clock for you guys. This is the open discussion round, and it starts when you begin speaking. So the whole point of a hero is to kind of see their arc. And, uh, you know, when we first meet Tony Stark, he's arrogant, he's egotistical, he's self-centered, he's just kind of everything, all the bad things. And then at the end one, he says that I am Iron Man. It's kind of shedding his first stage, if you will, of no longer being bad, no longer selling guns. He's still egotistical. He's still self-centered. Over the course of the movie, we kind of see little by little that shed. And, you know, like I said, by, by the time he gets to that point in game, he's, he's at his lowest. They're defeated. There's nothing left to do. So he makes the ultimate hero sacrifice and gives his life to, you know, bring back, I don't know, half the world's population. I don't remember how many people it was, but... Um, it was just something really cool to see that build out, play out over all those times and to 
kind of experience that. And uh, I think that's why that's the best one. Um, you know, Logan had its hits and misses and well, he may have not been in every movie. So it just kind of, obviously he made some decisions in Logan, but it was just, I feel like you need to have all of that downtrodden to build up that hero, to have them have their ultimate hero moment, to make it the best hero moment. And I don't feel like he had that many over all of those movies. Well, he, well, he, yeah, this, well, he didn't have kids, his, um, kids, more, but he, but, uh, you think Hugh Jackman, I think, made a major impact, um, with, uh, Wolverine. In fact, I think it's one of the reasons why I think, uh, it built, it built up, uh, the reason why at the forefront of Wolverine and, uh, as kind of like the most well known, um, X Men of X Men, and, and you could say that about Robert Downey Jr. He ended up becoming kind of the Godfather of the MCU. I mean, this was the guy who was a drug addict. Everyone's like, you're going to put him in a multi million dollar superhero movie, and everyone thought that was crazy. And here we are, twenty eight movies later, on the backs of a guy that no one wanted except for John Favreau. Even the studio was like, get out of here with that guy. Hugh Jackman, no one knew, and he and and Hugh Jackman was one of the most uh, luckiest luckiest man uh, to do it because um if it wasn't for uh a a a long Philly shoot uh mission pause two he would not have gotten the role but he but he did it and he managed to earn it with with three years and and throughout that way with especially within Ma with the master rent of james mangold um to, uh keeping it like keeping logan uh the way uh, as it should be in fact a uh, fine tooth now um uh, to make this an R-rated, uh, uh, the R rated character that we want, that we what have we seen, and and to and to make that as the perfect send off for for him for not only him but also for Lo for Patrick Stewart as well, but but with as the character of Logan, even like, in fact he even um uh, got to uh, play uh, a version of of a next version of Wolverine, an advanced version of him. And he still managed to even um, give and make a form, especially uh, when he's uh, working as Tim. And and it's but while well, you say like, oh, well, well his sexual journey of of Tony Stark been laid around in three years, um, mm -hmm. especially around kind of the future, kind of the future part in Endgame. There's one particular part that I think no one remembers from the Wolverine, and that's what I think from Machio told him that like. Like in the future, like uh, I, I see your death. You will die. I think. Uh, uh, I don't know. I think uh, impaled, uh, like losing blood, like bleeding, and mm -hmm. and you holding your heart. That happens to Logan, and he gives a magnificent performance with that, especially okay. when he gives up when he does his uh, animated rage at finally That's the same thing. Roar. Same thing happened in Age of Ultron, though, you know? I mean, Tony Stark knew he was going to die. He saw that vision when they were in that castle trying to get the scepter. So he knew the same thing. He knew all of his consequences were going to lead him to that, but he still did what he had to. What? He still had that moment, and it's, you know, the best leading hero in a comic book movie. And I feel like, you know, out of all that, he was the one who stood up and did what he had to do, what no one else would do. And so that was the what? ultimate hero, hero yeah. sacrifice, the ultimate performance to kind of do that over that amount of time and that many movies and too. time all right we're going to go into our one minute closings kevin you're up first time starts when you begin speaking i see the uh, like uh tony Stark going to see himself died he see he saw members of the avengers died in the age of Ultron. Uh, but i guess um look uh, looking at it your job is looking it's uh it's uh, the most wonderful and best forms in, in the hero movie in the hero the comic hero movie um because like it fought like throughout a uh, a decade of decade of of this journey, especially in him appearing small cameos uh, in some of the James McAvoy, uh, my my fascinating one. But he earned like this is a yeah, perfect uh, send off for him. He gets a a wonderful performance, especially uh, uh, with. Uh, with X twenty three and uh, Patrick Stewart uh, sitting by, you see you see him a, a wounded, uh, uh, old, a wrinkled, and, he, and especially one thing uh, uh, that's kind of difficult is working with uh, kids mutant, and he managed to portray them off. He it's 
this is his best performance. I yield my time. All right. And Andy, back over to you. You got one minute left when you speak. So Endgame was the culmination of 10 movies for Tony Stark, 11 years. Um, and you had a character who was going through so many different things. They've just been defeated. He, you know, and then we do the time jump and he's got his family. He's at war with Cap. He's at war with himself. He's at war with doing the right thing. You know, he's lost Peter, someone he really cared about as well. Somebody kind of thought of as a son. And he goes through all these decisions, realizing that he only has one thing to do, which is the right thing. So, like I mentioned before, something him Cap talked about in Cap 1, or sorry, Avengers 1, about being the guy that would jump on the grenade for everyone. And uh, he ended up doing that. And uh, I think that was a great way to kind of end his journey over all that time. And I cede my time. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and send you both to the back. Thank you once again. I will bring the judges back on screen. And Zach, you are up first this time around, sir. Who gets your vote? And as concise as you can hit it for me, what was the main selling point? Uh, Andy gets my vote because I feel like he better uh, explained why uh, Tony was the better like leading hero in an actual comic book movie. And he also mentioned all the sacrifices and consequences that Tony goes through in order to get from where he started to his to the end. So that's why Andy gets my vote. Okay. Sean, I go down to you. Who gets your vote and what sold you? I, I don't know how to judge this round because they talked about character arcs and they didn't really talk about performance. And the question was, what's the best performance? Um I guess I can really kind of go only off of the argument that was made. Um, I guess because of that, uh, I'd have to go with Andy because he gave me more specific ex examples um, of Tony's character. But yeah, I, I, this was this is a really hard one to judge because it's not the question that was asked. So I, I'd have to go with Andy, I guess. But yeah, that would be. That would be it for me. All right. I'll go ahead and send you guys to the back. Thank you so much. And I'll bring the competitors back in. And we will I will say ahead. that was a very that was a very tough question to prep for. I'm sorry. It's 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 like it's, really, uh, it's hard to talk about like, oh, I hate to disagree with things that I love. Like I'm a huge fan and like and I love the kind of like ah oh, I had to hate that to like, go against the uh well I fixed that for you. Now we're going to talk about shit that just got awful sucks. The question on the table is, what is the worst video game movie of the 2010s? We're going from things people like to things people hate. This is a very blatant switch. I don't think you'll have that problem with this round. But hey, everyone's got opinions. Who knows? All right. I'm going to go ahead and bring up the timer once again. Andy, you have a minute on the clock. The time starts when you begin speaking. Uh, when I got this question, there was only one that came to my mind, and that was the dumpster fire known as Assassin's Creed. And I will cede the rest of my time and save it for later on. All right, Kevin, I'm 10 seconds late, but if I know what's about to happen, it's fine. Time starts when you begin speaking. All right, my... My pick for the for the worst games, uh, worst video game movie of the 2010s is easily it's easily the the bloated, uh, boring mess of a movie called Rampage, and I yield my time. All right, let me get this <laughs> right. There we go. Okay, three, two, one. There we go. And for those viewing at home, because they went less than a minute between the two of them, the answers are for Andy, Assassin's Creed, and for Kevin, the Dwayne Johnson film Rampage. All right, we're going to go ahead and go into the two-minute section. Andy, you are up first. Time starts when you begin speaking. Okay, so you, you took a game franchise that at this point had been a lot of games in deep. You had a lot of lore to build off. You had really you had a whole template there to do a really great movie. You brought in Michael Fassbender, who's coming off of you know playing a really good Magneto in the X-Men movies. And then it just got out of hand from there. There was lots of behind the scenes stuff with Ubisoft wanting one thing, the studio wanting another. And what we got on screen is the, I guess the birth of that. Um, I don't know where to start, maybe with the opening track. Uh, if you've played the Assassin's Creed game, you know, it's kind of more of a epic and 
you know, that kind of music. And the opening track is a rock song. It just felt very weird out of place, very weird way to start the movie. Um, then they have maybe about a five minute scene set back in time and then all of a sudden they go back to modern day. Um, when you play the Assassin's Creed games, you know, you play to be in the Animus. It's kind of the thing you want to do. They don't spend a lot of time on there. The plot is really weird. He is sentenced to die for apparently killing a pimp, which just seems a very weird thing to get the death penalty for. Then they fake his death somehow and then bring him into this super secret prison that no one knows about. And then it's kind of like they didn't even play the games, really. They just kind of did what they wanted, took bits and pieces. The Animus is now a weird animatronic arm that looks like it's out of the Matrix. Uh, when they do fight scenes, they go back and forth between what's going on in the real world and what's going on in the dream world. It kind of takes you out of the fight scenes. I don't get why they did a lot of those things. You had a really good cast. I almost feel like they, it was a magic trick of giving us a good cast, only to give us a really crap movie. I mean, you had Michael Fassbender, you had Marianne Cotillard, you had Jeremy Irons, you had Brendan Gleeson, you had Michael K. Williams, and you you didn't do really anything with them. Um, it really honestly would have been a better show than a movie. The, the story kind of jumps around a lot. It's flat, it's messy, the editing is really weird. And I will see the rest of my time there. All right. So as the clock ramps down there, Kevin, when it hits zero, your time will begin when you speak. Okay. So the reason why I went is, uh, say, Rampage. It's because, like, here's the thing. Rampage, uh, the, the, game, the video game, it's actually one of the fun, fun uh, monsters uh, just destroying the town uh, about it. But the – and the movie – it's kind of just like a like boring uh carbon copy of uh, carbon copy of like like, 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 like Godzilla movie, and, and it's not like one of the fun ones uh, like from the from the past. But this is one that's more like uh, something kind of like a car, trying to copy the legendary films uh, of the MonsterVerse, and and the thing is, it could have done something like like say become like become like a uh, like in the game where um three three people and uh, like ended up uh, being tricked into a a science experiment and they transform into into a monster like like the gorilla the lizard and the wolf and but instead it's just more of like oh oh lab lab science 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 was wrong in fact of in fact of three different types of animals and and they're they end up getting loose we must stop them oh and we end up using the white gorilla as a uh, that's a good one. Like, really? Like, just really? Just you have to use the white gorilla, and not, not have them, not have them at least be one of them be infused with the creature. At least be some kind of like a, uh, be like horrific uh humanoid monster. At least, at least have them have powers. At least, uh, but no, but no, they're truly, like, but no, it's uh, giant white gorilla, uh, uh, law big wolf, uh, large wolf, wolf. And a crocodile, blog crocodile. That's it. And and it's just and it, okay, see, it's the rock being the rock. Jeffrey Dean Morgan uh, being being all silent. Uh, kind kind of a government a, government generic government agent six one 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 one. Uh, and it's just a bloated, boring CGI mess. And I yield my time. All right, we're gonna go into the four minute open discussion, guys. The timer starts when the first person speaks. You know, I think you said it best. You, it was The Rock being The Rock, which is kind of what you want in a movie. Um, entertainment, you know, it's Entertainment Valley. I mean, that video game's pretty much monsters going through the city and destroying it, which is what you got. And it should have, I mean, it, I think it made a lot of money, but it's like Assassin's Creed. You had eight games at that point. This movie was budgeted at $125 million. I mean, $240 million. I don't know where the money went. I'm assuming into all the actors that kind of just look bored, like they're there because it's a paycheck. And which my 18 percent on rotten i mean you can't huh? eat that hair i mean look at that hair <laughs> yeah but it's, and it's just i i feel like they kind of read the clip note versions of this of the video games they didn't even play them kind of like what they did with uncharted they just kind of gave you the certain things and then they kind of did what they wanted it's kind of like a paint by numbers is what they did with assassin's creed they were like oh we're going to take some from this game then we're going to take some from this game and then we're going to fast forward it and then you're not going to get to spend that much time back in time which was kind of dumb too that's the whole point of assassin's creed um, I watched about an hour of it today to see how bad it was. It's still as bad as I remember. 
I don't, I don't know about that. I feel, I feel like the uh, the, the actual screen actually does does kind of work well with himself. Uh, especially with part, I feel like Michael Fassbender does give a, a not bad performance in that movie. Like it's he's not uh, not some just a generic person like the Rock, just like uh, an a zoologist. But I feel like uh, I feel like with Santa Creed, it it actually does kind of get the basis of the game at least. Of it with yeah, but I mean, you know, it's it. I just it it didn't work. Like I said, that that I don't know if you remember the Animus. It was like that arm from the Matrix that brings them down, and he's kind of moving around. It was very weird. It, I've never seen anything like that before. And then yeah, it it, you know. it would have been that, or been it would have been, or they would have done the. Generic to like Avatar, so. yeah. But I mean, so that's what I'm just saying. It's just, they they kind of took the name and a few other things and cut and paste and made a movie. You know, Rampage going to get monsters destroying a city, fighting each other. Yeah, and, can't, that's can't, what, can't. and that's what we got. We got exactly what the video game is. No, but uh, it's not more. It's, not, it's more because here's the thing: with it wasn't fun though. The point is like it's you're. You're one of three creatures, uh, one of humans that turn into uh, creatures. These are just gene- uh, generic, uh, giant sized creatures. Like they don't have like they don't have any powers. They don't have any. They don't do anything because you think the uh, the reptile one actually throw spit top fire in the game in the video game. Uh, well, yeah, it, 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 but yeah, first of all, that and also um, it just it just kind of like uh, like like oh oh. Generic uh, corporation of we we're doing this for the money. We just like oh oh we we'll just keep going with this experiment uh, stuff. They they didn't come up with any, the only one creative act they did was the opening scene with with a giant uh, spike rad. That was the most interesting part, and they killed it off in less than five minutes after the opening movie. That's it. And said, I mean, it, it, at least it had some interesting parts. Assassin's Creed just kind of felt like it was going to the beats of a story, but it didn't feel like a story. I feel like they actually tried to make it like a video game, but they failed. And a lot of characters do things for no reasons. They have emotions for no reason. Michael's Fassbender's character gets mad at people, tries to kill him, but no one stops him. When he's not in the Animus, you know, that's he's trying to kill people. And then Everyone just looks bored, like they don't want to be there. Michael K. Williams, who's a really great actor, is just relegated to some guy who's in this apparently prison that we're not really explained how it's there or why it's there or no one knows about it. And but, but they, somehow, they, somehow Michael Fassbender is someone's descendant. You know, they, they just don't really explain a lot of things. They kind of expect you to know everything. And like I said, it's like yeah, they but, didn't I, really play the games. They just kind of threw it all out and used the name and used a few other things from it and kind of made their own movie of a Frankenstein movie. Not even yeah. really based on the video game anymore. Yeah, but they use um, Michael Fassbender. I kind of like they manipulate him to be tricked. Or like, oh, uh, you could we could find you could find around uh, with uh, riding around New Life and and time. Oh, All right, we're like... gonna go ahead and go on to the one minute closings. Andy, you are up first. What's the time starts when you begin speaking? All right. So, like I said, uh, you know, Assassin's Creed, a lot of games, a lot of lore, a lot of a lot of story for you to build off and make a really good movie. Um, they spent $125 million on this, made 240 Rotten Tomatoes of 18. Everyone looks bored to be in that movie, even Michael Fassbender a little bit. It's got a very plot that makes no sense. Um, lots of really weird editing and the fight scenes of not something you would feel like in a video game. Didn't feel like the video game at all. Um, and like I said, the music was weird. And they did a lot of that lens flare, that JJ Abrams lens flare during the fight scenes, a lot of shadowing out the characters so you only see their shadows as they're fighting. And just a lot of a uh, huge mess. And uh, I just, that's my time. Okay. Go ahead and jump it forward just a little bit. Kevin, once it rolls around to zero, you have one minute left on the clock. The timer starts when you begin speaking. Uh, with that screen, I feel like, I feel like they, uh, they they kept at least the spirit of the game, uh, at least, with the movie. But with Rampage, they kind of just feel like, uh, let's just copy a, uh, the base of just monsters destroying the town, and that's it. And just have it be uh, a generic, like a generic uh, monster destroying town. Uh, and, but, let, but let's have a rock save it. In fact, yes, but yes, it, the movie did well, but that doesn't mean that's being city. Good. I mean, transform the Transformers series did well financially. The box of it, but that doesn't. But that doesn't mean they're good. Uh, 
and yeah, and yeah, and bad because one of the factors was uh, the rock blade hype, like, like is was trying to get people like, hey, let's watch the movie. Go, go watch, go watch the movie. I'm in, I'm in. Hell, hell, I might be in your movie theater. Ooh, ooh, that's what he did. But rampage, it's it, it, it's a fun uh, being a um, uh, monster arc, uh, arcade game. But this one, it just like. They just kind of ruin the fun aspect of it and not much creatures of it. And time. All right, guys. Thank you once again. I'm going to go ahead and send you guys to the back as I bring the judges into the call. Uh, so there's not a lot to uh, fact check necessarily. Uh, as, as, you know, general, when I'm judging, I try not to fact check as much. All the box office numbers, critic numbers, all that sounds pretty much correct. Uh, to what I know. So the few things that I did find is uh, at the time of the film's release, uh, Assassin's Creed had uh, nine main series games that were released, uh, and that's not counting the multiple spinoffs that were released to smaller consoles or to PC ports. Uh, they also had the 10th game in development during the production of the film. Uh, in terms of, since it was brought up, the change of the animus, I was able to find a quote from a Michael Fassbender interview that was given while they were promoting the film. Uh, and the reason that the change was given is because they felt that the design of the animus in the games where you simply sit into a chair or go into some kind of machine that looks like a CAT scan machine at times just isn't a visually pleasing thing to look at. Uh, to quote him exactly, we didn't want to have something where I sit in a seat. Number one, we've seen it before in The Matrix. It's also just not very a very dramatic experience when we're doing the modern day version of regression. We wanted to have something where the character is actually physically involved in it. Uh, and then finally, uh, I decided to look up if you were to kill a pimp, would you receive the death sentence? And I found mostly stories of pimps re themselves receiving the death sentence, which does make more sense. Uh, however, I did find one a horrifying story of a girl who at 16 years of age was sentenced to life in prison after killing a man who had pimped her out for sex as well as raped her. However, she was released after serving 15 years when the case was reversed. That has nothing to do with movies, but sometimes I come across weird things while doing research and I like to share, like I'm a kid in show and tell. With all that said, Sean, I go over to you, sir. All based off the arguments, who gets your vote and what was the main selling point? I, I feel like I need a beer and I should be sitting behind a desk and going, boy, that escalated quickly. That yeah, escalated right? fast. Um, I'm going to give this point to Andy once again. Um, he hit back on uh, something that uh, Kevin wound up saying, which was, you know, that's uh, the rock being the rock. And he goes, yeah, well, yeah, it's the rock being the rock. You want to go to the movies, you want to have a good time. So there was that. Um, I think that he just wound up hitting on the points about the fact that it was a wasted property. They had such a great cast. They had so many different opportunities to make things really, really good. And there was so much uh, uh, difficulty behind the scenes. I would wind up leaning more towards uh andy especially because he did talk about just how messy the film got in terms of its its story as well so yeah I'd give my point to andy okay zach down to you uh i'm actually going to say andy as well i feel like he brought out more reasons why it was a uh worst movie like all the behind the scenes things the bad fight scenes the soundtrack and also he, him talking about um, how you had so much lore to pull from and it seemed like they never really played the game. So for that, I'm going to give my point to Andy. All right. Well, judges, thank you guys so much. I'm going to go ahead and sit you guys in the back because your winner by a knockout score of three to zero, it is Andy Sweet coming in with the knockout. And last time, sir, you were on the negative end of one. Uh, and yes. this time you do end up on the positive end of one. How are you feeling after that match? Uh, you know, it feels good. You know, I uh, like I said, last time I got kind of knocked around. Um, so it makes you kind of reevaluate your game plan about how you go about these matches, kind of studying a lot more, kind of really – being smart about your choices for your answers too, because that really definitely helps. Um, picking movies you kind of know a lot about, whether they're good or bad, I think helps. Um, plus it gives me an excuse to watch those movies again. Um, so that's kind of what I did. I just made sure I picked the right movies for my answers and just kind of did the best I could apart from that, you know, that 
superhero performance one, but you know, it's just notes for next time. Um, it was fun, you know, like I said, it was fun to kind of play someone who's on the same level as me, just duking it out. Uh, that last round was a lot of fun. Those were some terrible movies. So it's always good to kind of really go at it, both having good points about both those movies and uh, looking forward to the next one. Yeah, absolutely. And sp speaking of the next one, you know, right now we're kind of at that place where we're starting to kind of wrap up uh, everyone's, you know, next round of matches. Uh, a number of the competitors are in the title picture and a number of the competitors are taking a part in our uh, summer invitational tournament. And so that kind of sits you right on the outset of all that, uh, mm -hmm. kind of waiting to see who's on deck for an opponent, but is there anybody that you're aware of uh, out there in the world of movie battleground that would interest you as an opponent, or are you just kind of willing to take whatever comes next? I'm willing to take whatever comes next. I'm just, I like to have fun. I like to talk movies with people, debate movies. So it's, it's fun. I'm ready for the next one. Whoever wants to play me, I'll, I'll play him. All right. Well, Andy, thank you once again, sir. I appreciate your me. time. I'm going to go ahead. Congratulations. And I will send you to the back as I bring in Kevin Moreno and Kevin, man, I, I feel awful for you, my dude, but clearly what we're learning here is all you need to do is get a vote is get a point to win. Because the moment you got a point, you won that match. And every other time, you've just yet to pick up the point. It's a tough loss, but how are you feeling? Feeling be I'm feeling better. I'm feeling better. Like my, I, I would say I would say mentally, basically, uh, right now, I, I'm uh, doing this match, like, but not well. It just, like, just some stuff happened. But, um, but I'm feeling good right now. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling comfortable with this loss. Like, like, this was a, like... Some some questions I'm like, eh. I had a really tough like tough debate again. I feel like I do love Iron Man, but yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. And uh, yeah, man, it, it it it's really tough uh, to you know. I I appreciate you for having the good spirits that you have, man, because you've taken three hard losses so far in the league. I hope that we'll have you back another time. Uh, if you if you are coming back, you know, is there anyone out there that interests you or are you just hoping for someone easier again the next time around? Is that where we're at at this point? I don't mind hoping for someone easier. Like this one, this, this one, like I, I don't have, I don't have any uh, person to call out. Like I, which is, I don't mind, I don't mind facing someone again. I like, I, I, lo I love doing this, like when it like, winning or losing but it's, it's fun doing this it's really fun absolutely man and so thank you once again you know it, it, as, a, as a producer you know I, i've seen the growth in a bunch of competitors and, and i have seen growth in you as a competitor man it, you know obviously the wins haven't come as much as you'd want but i think the confidence in the speaking when you look back at your first match against jeremy to now you're certainly getting there more and more every time uh and i just hope that the next matchup whoever it may be uh, is one that goes a little more in your favor. But, Kevin, thanks again for playing, and we will see you next time on the Battleground uh, as I hit you to the back. And, guys, that will be it. Uh, another match in the books. Andy Sweet, uh, you know, off the back of wanting to prove himself, comes in, gets a knockout, push, pushes himself up the ranks. Kevin, unfortunately, still there with that 1-3 and three record, but... You know, with the competitors on the lower end of the scale, for me as a producer, the biggest thing is about seeing people grow in confidence. And I think that we are seeing that with Kevin. And hopefully at some point in the near future, that growth in confidence will turn itself around and bring points to him. But guys, that is it for another edition of Movie Battleground. Be sure to like the video, drop a comment if you have any thoughts, subscribe to the channel for more Movie Battleground, because we have some big ones coming up this week. Uh, tomorrow night, on its brand new night of Monday night, we have the first exhibition match going up on the exhibition match's new night, and it is a Jurassic exhibition, both park and world of your choosing, in honor of Jurassic World Dominion coming out this Friday. We have a Jurassic Park match happening. We also have a Pixar match happening next week in honor of Lightyear. And we have a couple of other matches happening along the way as we build up to Sunday, June 19th, in which the title match between defending champion Henry Sanchez and yours truly will be happening. And God almighty, I hope it's not painful. With all that said, though, guys, my name is Aaron Canole. I will see you next time on the Movie Battleground. Take care, everybody.